Okay, everyone, welcome back from the break. And uh, I'd like to uh, let's welcome our third panel of the day, yeah. chaired by Amy Farrow, about creating a decision quality culture in high tech. Uh, I'm really excited to lead this panel uh, with all of you today and with my, my panelists. Um, I did want to just start out in full disclosure. I am a newcomer. Uh, I have Randeep to thank uh, for, for inviting me to come lead this panel today. Um, I'm really excited to lead uh, our discussion on uh, creating a decision quality culture in high tech. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, then introduce my panelists, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, just like the previous sessions, please, like, I have the, the poll, polling list up here. If you have questions, uh, submit them, and I'll work to integrate them into the conversation. Um, so just first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently an engineering director at Lyft. Um, and I, I basically focus on leading uh, technical programs and operations across our rideshare business. Um, what I've, uh, but beyond that, my experience at Lyft, I've spent 20 years in this industry. Um, some names of companies you may know, you may not. Uh, I started at Siebel. If, you, if, if any of you remember Siebel Systems. Um, I worked at Salesforce uh, during very early stages uh, from the company going from about 1,200 to I think eight or 9,000. Um, Twitter, um, and a few startups in between. So um, I've, uh, I've kind of been part of uh, many companies uh, in this space uh, and also been part of uh, many decisions uh, along the way. Um, so basically, I'm really excited to facilitate this conversation and now just want to move over to introduce Carl uh, and Shashi. So uh, on the left, or on your right, I should say, uh, is Dr. Carl Spetzler. I think many of you know him, but since you know, we are embracing kind of new and old in this conference. Like, I don't want to assume that all of you know him. Um, he's the chairman and CEO of Strategic Decisions Group and co-author of Decision Quality, Value Creation from Better Business Decisions. Uh, he's a past president and fellow of the Society of Decision Professionals. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Uh, Shashi Jain is an innovation manager at Intel Corp who brings startups and, uh, and, and corporations together for joint projects to accelerate innovation. Uh, Shashi has built a tool for applying decision quality to those projects in under an hour. Welcome, Shashi. So before I like open with the first question, uh, I was reflecting after the, the panels this morning, which were great. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. Um, there was a lot of talk about the input to the models and the tools and to AI and, 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 to, and to machine learning. Um, and I think what is interesting about our discussion today is we're really moving to the human side of decision making and, and really the, 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 the inputs that drive uh, a lot of the tooling investments. Um, and, and some that can't, some that we can't and will never automate. Um, so just kind of acknowledging we're moving to like the human side of decision making. Um, first, you know, we say we want to create create uh, a, a decision quality culture. So I, I first want to open with, uh, what is the decision culture in high tech that you see today, and where would you want it to go? Uh, we can start with Carl. Well, so I define a decision culture as part of the overall culture, and it's very central to it, and it's kind of how we make decisions around here. If you ask people uh, about that, and they'd say, well, what kind of decisions? Well, all the decisions that are happening. And so the decision culture is very unique in the world of high tech to the companies. I found some that are extremely autocratic top down. I find some that are very intensive in terms of trying to be collaborative bottom up. Uh, they're very different between mature companies in high tech. Uh, and companies that are startups, and they vary greatly because the, in the early stages, the founder key leaders are almost uh, the, uh, the ones that define the decision culture. Mm -hmm. And decision cultures, and most people in high tech don't know what we mean with decision quality. They wouldn't be able to state the six requirements of decision quality or apply them. Okay? So, they're making it on the basis of what they know. And high tech has certain nature to it that's very, that, that's the rapid cycle okay, of innovation. And so uh, you're making decisions 
that define the future and roadmaps and, and stepwise. And, and people don't differentiate uh, between big decisions and small decisions. Habits of people, of the leaders that make the decisions, uh, you know, they, they arise from their most common decisions. And most of them that think of uh, decision making is a matter of a choice of style rather than meeting decision quality. So there's a where we are today in the natural setting, if you do an analysis, an assessment, where are you relative to what a decision quality culture would be, there's usually a pretty big gap. And it can be very different, uh, you know, and depending on the style of the leaders. Ultimately, it's defined by the leaders that are the decision makers, uh, usually the impact of the decision professional on that is slow and uh, they're more like a tool to that, okay? So that's where I come from. Um, so I agree with a lot of what uh, Carl had to say. I would, I would summarize it that uh, it's relentlessly outcome focused. Um, it, uh, I see it very clearly at Intel. I work with a lot of startups uh, at Intel and uh, they're, they're the same way. It's like, how can we get to a better outcome faster? What are, what's the process that we use? And when, um, you know, when you talk to the C-levels of a startup, they're oftentimes really, um, yeah, yes, very tops down, but they're also uh, getting their decision um, methodology from their mentors and from the VCs that they're working with. And it varies across the board how much discipline they'll be able to put down uh, into, into decision making. Uh, some of it's very ad hoc, gut feel, fail fast. You know, that's what we uh, worship in innovation and startup land. Um, but um, with a little bit of extra diligence uh, and, uh, you know, fr frankly, the decision quality framework, uh, they, can, they can do better. Um, so I can talk a little bit about bottom uh, about uh, Intel as well. Um, I would say at Intel, it's it depends on what group you're in and what super organization you're in, uh, how decision making uh, and the decision culture is. Uh, it's easy to say it's very tops down, but in some organizations, it's um, it can be very uh, bottoms up. Um, you know, in my um, experience in innovation, I have, I have no time to apply uh, full decision analysis on every single decision. I, I need to influence, like right now, uh, across multiple matrixed organizations that have no idea how to interact with each other. So um, culturally, when I talk to other corporate innovators and entrepreneurs, I teach them how to use decision quality to do that. So um, in a, in a I think it's a very powerful tool uh, for for corporate innovators and inter entrepreneurs, and uh, I've seen I've started seeing the adoption of that uh, more frequently. The first time I heard decision quality outside of a conference like this was actually last week. I was speaking at an innovation conference about metrics, about KPIs for innovation, the most boring damn thing in the world. <laughs> and then what do I hear uh, from an oil and gas company? Well, have you thought about using decision quality? I was like, yes, I have. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. Glad to see that it's spreading a little. Um, so kind of just keying off that, uh, two things that I want to move into talking about. One is speed and one is outcomes. Um, uh, my perspective is absolutely like most decisions are made and reflected on from the outcome lens. Um, I, I could almost say all uh, for, that I've been involved in and, and experienced. Um, so devil's advocate question is like, uh, it you know, T high tech decision making culture is, at least in, from what I've experienced, is heavily focused on experimentation and outcomes. So why measure, me excuse me, why measure decision quality when outcomes are the only thing that matter? Whoever wants to take it. Sure, um, I would love to take that one. Um, in terms of, um, I'll talk about entrepreneurial projects again. Uh, the first decision that you want uh, out of your management is, will you fund this? And you want a, you want a yes to that. And the more um, uh, you can frame a problem correctly for them, or uh, frame your approach, the the better and easier it is to uh, to do the innovation work. Um, and 
the, you know, the six, the six elements actually is a, is a really great way of framing that and anchoring your management uh, to, 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 see your, to see things your way. I mean, it sounds a lot like an advocacy type of a solution, but it's a great way to get them to think about the, the realistic alternatives that are uh, available to you in a brand new business. So if you're presenting to them, them something that's not old co, you're presenting them something that they've never seen before, then it gives them a great framework for them to understand and then create some mappings back into um, what they do understand. And so I, I had mentioned uh, uh, in my bio that you know I, I apply decision quality in about an hour. And I've done that by um, taking essentially the decision leadership course that Jim's team is sitting here. Um, I was sitting in that course, it was multiple days, and I was like, this is amazing. It's totally changed the way I'm going to talk about manage, uh, to my managers, but I can't apply it. It's completely useless to me to spend two to three weeks to do this. I need it to be done like in a day, maybe, and maybe an hour would be better. So I scribbled down a, a methodology to, get, if you've heard of Lean Canvas and, and Business Model Canvas, so now there's a decision quality canvas that, that I created that helps um, understand, or it helps build, basically you build a frame plus a few other things, uh, that can get you to uh, the point of um, you know, making a, a, a good decision in about an hour. Something that you can take into a manager and uh, convince them right away uh, that, that's, that that's the way to go. A kind of a long answer to a short question, but there you go. Uh, so uh, coming back to the, uh, this total focus on outcomes and results, uh, high tech, is, in many of the decisions, has a lot of uncertainty. Okay, uh, things are moving fast and are uncertain. And if you hold people to the, their feet to the fire on outcomes, and you have uncertain situations, they become very risk averse, mm -hmm. which is completely opposite of what high tech needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so high tech often needs uh, the ability to embrace uncertainty and make high quality decisions, good bets, you know, take the appropriate risks, calculated risks, and that means you can't just count the outcomes. If you measure people on results and you forget about the fact that they took a calculated risk and on this one they lost and therefore this person is out and you start doing that systematically, instead of having a rapid uh, risk intelligent organization you end up having a very heads down, just do my thing, and don't take any personal risks. So this separation between outcomes and risks, uh, I think there's a big misunderstanding. We had a, a, an introduction this morning where someone said, well, you know, I'm here, and we don't really care about outcomes. We only care about outcomes in decision quality. It's just the way to get more good outcomes on the average is to focus on the decisions. If you focus on the outcomes only and measure only outcomes, you're actually going to get a significantly worse average outcomes than you would if by, it, the lever you have for improving outcomes is better decisions and better execution, okay? I mean, let's never forget the execution piece of this. So focusing on the quality of the decisions will generate for you more better good outcomes and will make you conscious of the downside and you won't learn wrong. If you, having a bad outcome on a decision that was a good one, the thing to do is, okay, we expected that. That was on the, you know, we said one chance in three, we'd lose all our money in this. It came through. Now what? Well, shake it off, go on to the next one and do it fast. Fail fast, fail early, be smart, all those things are really consistent with focusing on decisions rather than just outcomes, okay? So Carl, um, you have a lot of experience working with different companies. Yeah. Um, can you maybe talk about an instance or uh, from the past where you feel like you've, you've gone into an organization who maybe didn't think about it the way that you just described and were able to kind of move, move, move them, them more Health, healthily toward looking at both quali decision quality and outcomes together? Again and again and again. Th that's, uh, it's probably the biggest frame-shifting learning you can have for decision makers. Uh, 
And uh, let me say something else. The real so, uh, uh, core to the culture of decision making is the decision makers. Okay, so ultimately we got to get into their heads the six requirements, and if we can get it into teens, we, we're teaching teens in high school to be able to say the six elements like this, frame, alternatives, information, values, uh, commitment to action is their fist, okay? Sound reasoning and then commitment. And they, if they can get that in a couple days, you can get that into the automatic response of the decision makers. They've got to be able to do what you're doing with your canvas of in, in an hour, or in some cases they see that this decision is a decision project and we ought to take three weeks on it. But they should be able to apply that, that fundamental. And it, it's a decision maker training that changes the culture, not just having decision pro support professionals in the room. And so that's, that's the key. Have I, I think almost every time we're engaged, this being able to make people conscious about how, what the difference between a quality of a choice and the result is huge. And for the financial executives, it's even bigger, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you guys are from Intel. M I have experienced what I'd call strategic finance professionals, and Intel has that. That is really impressive to me. Mm -hmm. okay? And then I've got these finance professionals that are really control professionals, mm -hmm. and they only want to measure black and white the outcomes. They're all about accounting, okay? So how do we count the truth and get truth-telling? And for them, the idea of judging the quality of the decisions instead of outcomes is horror. They say, look, decisions are about the future. We can't measure that now. And I know people around here, they'll all lie. They'll tell you it's going to be great. The, the, the alternative we're going to do, it's always going to be great. So how in the hell do we hold their feet to the fire and get them to be truth-telling about future stuff that we can't measure? Okay? So they're really in a dilemma. Decision-making is all about future. Accounting is all about present and past. And this results measurement is at the heart of it. So shifting that is huge. So just uh, following up to that, audience, uh, there's, a, there's a question around, um, can you give an example of, uh, or, or, or reference data that shows that, that, that investing in, in, in decision quality has produced better outcomes? What, how would you, how would oh, you yeah. demonstrate that, that, that? That's easy, okay? It's, by now, the track record of ROI and being able to show that on the average, uh, applying this adds 30%, 50% without adding costs in terms of better outcomes on the average when you count it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the way going to Chevron outperforming. Chevron was a near major 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the winning major today, okay? And it's all, or let me say, it's all due to 80% of it is due to the Chevron way, which is a collaborative way of uh, going after the best decisions and applying decision quality and making good bets. This is a high bet industry. Now, in uh, an easy place to show it in high tech is where people have uh, uh, applied portfolio methodologies because there's a whole bunch of decisions that have to be made, so you can measure the averages and invariably these kind of uh, applications end up with 30, 40, 50 percent better returns for the, for the investments. So it's, it's I, I don't think the question of do you get a big benefit for it is, is a big question anymore, okay? How do you, can you just elaborate a little bit on how, and then I'll come, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, there's a lot of interest in your canvas. Um, uh, how do you, go about like measuring that, like tactically in an organization so you can kind of sh show so, that so in real time. In, in, and there's not much of this in the early stage companies, okay? But in companies that have become mature, they, 
They focus on the decision. They create a decision record that is effective for a look back later. Mm -hmm. So you can create a learning loop that says, you know, and, and let's assume we've made a significant decision about a new product roadmap, okay? And uh, you say, well, when would we want to look back on this and see if we could learn for future decisions to have done it better? And the record should include what you would put on your canvas, the frame and the alternatives and so on, all the six elements, how we've documented that they have quality, plus kind of the, the, the look back from a look forward point of view, okay? So to be able to really look back well, you ought to, at the time you make the decision, saying, what can we audit, okay? Because once you're in a hindsight mode, you have a huge bias. You, you, can't, you can't get through the bias of hindsight if you're, if you're looking back on an outcome. So you have to set up for it at the time of decision. And when people do that, they see the results. And you have to have enough of them then to be able to build the results. Okay? That's the, uh, first, you want to apply decision quality at the decision level and portfolio level. Next, you really apply it as an organizational capability and the, a work stream of what decisions should we be making and how do we tackle them. And then you get to this organizational this capability which uh, the Rafa Howard Award is, is trying to be, and today we're going to have China Mobile receiving it, and we'll hear about how that gets deeply adopted in an organization on just about all decisions. Can I answer some of that? Sure. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I've, I've only seen it on the opposite side, where it's mm -hmm. used in, in very small organizations and startups. Um, you know, the, and I'll preface this by saying the plural of anecdote is not data. So, uh, but uh, in, you know, I've, I've taught startups how to get past, um, uh, how, to, how to look at their strategy by um, making small enough decisions, making a whole lot of them in parallel or, in, in, uh, or serializing them, uh, and then measuring them using a, um, you know, a, a, a very clear binary metric. Either you did or you didn't do uh, what you wanted to do at the end of it. Uh, an example of this would be um, there's a company called Vector Legal Method that was in a Techstars accelerator. Uh, they were having a terrible time building a strategy. Uh, basically, CMO C and CEO were aligned against the CTO. So we sat down and we did a uh, decision canvas with them. And we showed them they were actually not that far off, but that the CTO was bringing up a really damn good point that they could open up a lot of business but if you just added these two extra features. And so they created a strategy that would, that would test for that. It was um, a three-month-long strategy. And they would build out uh, an MVP of these things, uh, these two features. And at the end of it, did they get two customers that would take these things? Uh, really tiny thing. Uh, but then they also had follow-on strategies that would come out of that. Uh, who, the, who else they would go to, how they would grow the, the size of their market and their, uh, their feature set. And they were able to successfully navigate that. And not only did they get those customers, but they were able to get an organization after that and expand beyond that. So if you, I mean, yeah, if you go the opposite direction and you take a lot of small decisions together and serialize them, I think you can gain some velocity and, there. And what you're just describing is the key nature that makes the high tech different. There are a lot of these. Uh, multi-stage decisions and product extensions and product revisions and, and, and learn and go on. And because the steps incrementally are not hugely costly and we can revise, you shouldn't be putting the kind of effort in that you do when you spend $2 billion under the ground. Mm -hmm. so, so decision quality is very different and has to be light and fast in the world of high tech, especially these early stage companies. You know, I, I would not want to ha take the template of a oil and gas kind of company and put it on Lyft. Uh, it would be the wrong, wrong way to think about decision quality. Decision quality is the quality that's needed in the time cycle you have for making the decision. And so I think what you're describing is, is how it should work, okay? So uh, 
I, I, I think you, you both made really great points, and I think you're actually also moving in a direction that the audience is interested in, which is, um, I'll, I'll throw out a few ideas and then let you respond first, Shashi. Uh, so first, I just want to tell you, a lot of interest in your canvas. So any way you can find to share it with this group, they would love, so follow up after. Um, but, uh, and it kind of keys off of Carl's last point, like how, how, do you, how do you, when do you use this, you know, our you know, speed-based template, what decisions is it appropriate for? And then honestly, like how does it actually work? Maybe you could use an example of where, for the, of a decision you've used it uh, to make. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the easy answer for this is uh, low organizational complexity, low analytical complexity, very easy to do, um, uh, to apply something like this there. Um, so think of it as, um, and, and the way I've seen it used to greatest effect is for a person who has no power in their organization to uh, convince others that do have power uh, that they're right or that uh, there's a different approach to the, the direction they would like to take. So, I mean, um, that was the first part of it was what it's used for. What was the second part? And kind of how uh, it's used? I mean, feel free to answer how you wish. It's just more, it's this speed question mm -hmm. and, and how, how is it, uh, maybe an example of what you used it for. Gotcha. And then generally just like, yeah. I mean, I think you answered the like, when is it appropriate? Okay. So um, those kinds of decisions come up all the time for an innovation manager. Um, when do I invest uh, in, uh, in one startup project versus another? Um, what direction am I going to take on a new, uh, in a new focus area? Uh, for example, I was given uh, uh, is an Intelism AR action required, it's an action item, to go and uh, get us into uh, wearables. And it was just, I was told to do just that, just like that. Go get us into wearables, innovate on wearables. Uh, I was like, sure, fine, let's, let's do it. Um, go Intel, you know. Um, so uh, the first question that I asked was, what are the next five things that I have to decide? And so uh, I'm going to walk you through how the canvas works. Um, so you build a frame. You have your givens. You have your defers. You have the things you focus on. I limit the things you focus on to five things. And that gives me my ability to do these micro strategies. What are the next five things I have to worry about? Um, finding a partner, uh, getting into a, uh, getting into the right kind of um, wearable that my business unit would desire, making sure that there is enough uh, hay to uh, to harvest, essentially, and then I had to uh, think about who was, uh, who would I have to listen to that I really didn't want to listen to, All right? So this would be the the business units. These would be the voices that you need to bring into the room that you don't have in the room because you're doing it on a canvas instead of the real process that actually brings everyone together. What are the voices? You write some quotes from the voices. Uh, and it, it, it sometimes will feel like, um, you know, you're writing, uh, you have ghosts whispering over your shoulder. But it's important to bring them in, uh, to bring those perspectives in, because it then informs what are those next five choices that you need to make, or five decisions you need to make, <laughs> as well as the things you value and you trade off, uh, or, and the values and the risks. So just like you do in the lean canvas, you iterate over the frame. And the, the quality of the frame gets better as you listen to, as you add more voices, as you add more guardrails and givens, as you explore more uh, what are the constraints versus what are the things you can push on. And believe me, when, when they tell me I have a given, it's not a given until it's, I say it is. So um, I'll, I'll, and this, uh, this is the point where you need to uh, we need to understand as an innovation manager, like we're bringing new things that to a company that turns sand into microprocessors, right? And they understand that real well. But bringing in uh, wearables, understanding how a person's uh, health and performance is measured from that is just beyond the management chain uh, up, I mean, all the way to the top. So you have to uh, inform them. And sometimes the guardrails that they give you are not valid guardrails. So, uh, Putting into um, the frame the right uh, things will inform your, will help educate your, your user, your uh, decision maker. Can I ask a question here yeah. of our uh, colleague? Sure. Uh, is this a tool that would be used by the decision maker or by the person that wants to take a recommendation into a decision maker? This would be both. Both. 
Yes. Um, okay. I've used it uh, to great effect as a recommender, um, okay. or as a you know a, a, someone who's going and asking for a decision to be made. Yes. You have the voices of the recommenders and experts on the mm -hmm. side. There's a place for that, Good. Uh, and it uh, it's really about educating the decision maker. Uh, so. Um, in the case of the wearables project, uh, we educated them on what were the what were the most lucrative areas and which way we were going to go. So, what partners, what specific area, what um, uh, you know, what approach were we going to take? B two B, B two C, that kind of thing. And we were able to walk in and show them four or five different options. We're going to go into construction. We're going to go into factory workers uh, inside of warehouses. We're going to go into full medical. We're going to go into insurance. And uh, we were able to show the differences in the strategies. This is, I'm, I'm sorry, it really feels like I am mansplaining to a bunch of de decision professionals <laughs> who know this stuff. But there's a power in showing this on a PowerPoint slide. Be, um, all the different options, and instead of this stupid good, better, best that everyone always asks for, you can you can say here, there's here's a couple of different meal plans. You choose which uh, you know what what modifications you want to make, and then I'll tell you how much extra it's going to cost you. Uh, and making the decision as simple as that, give me some options, and then um, fund me is a lot more palatable than uh, going through the. Uh, the weeks-long process of getting getting negoti of negotiating mm -hmm. a new plan uh, idea. So, uh, outcome of this was we actually got funded, fifty thousand dollars. Put this into a startup. They did a joint project with us, a joint venture with us. They built their product. Uh, they completely revised their product onto Intel, and within a month, they had five customers, five big customers: FedEx and UPS. Uh, Wegmans, Diageo, and we uh, were then able to walk them into the CIO's office of each one of those companies and scale them up. And so then we were faced with another strategy, and three months later, after we had worked with them on that, with another strategy, and we chained these canvases together, essentially. So I'm going to pause there. Um, Devil's Advocate question is, uh, is it the framework, or basically how much is the framework responsible versus... Um, the kind of uh, smart advisor. So is your goal to kind of democratize this for everyone to use? Like how would you, how would you think about answering that one? Uh, yeah, the goal of this is to um, make it so that anyone can use it. Uh, I've been really remiss in actually writing about it and making sure that people outside of Mother Intel can use it. Um, you but have a reason now. Yeah, now I have a reason now that I put it out here, I better do it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, um, yeah, there's a, there's a measure of, um, you know, the, the, the expert and the person who's bringing, or developing the canvas, um, but giving them a frame is a, common is a common language. I do this two ways. You can sit with the canvas and write it out yourself, and oftentimes you come out with things that are just not that great. Um, whereas if you do it facilitated or if you do it in pairs, kind of like pair programming for those who are in, in tech, everyone here, um, you, you have um, like a devil's advocate that can sit over your shoulder and, and push you on what are the real options, what are the real things that you need to do, focus on now. Um, so in a sense, it's a way of spreading culture as well. Um, so I'm going to take us in a little bit different direction. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of interest in the room around kind of how to influence and, 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 and change the culture of decision makers in t inside organizations. But before we jump into that, uh, we uh, thought it would be interesting to talk about some of um, the kind of dysfunctional behaviors we see today. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, we have about eight that we uh, kind of experienced ourselves. Um, I'm just going to talk through them. I'd love like show of hands if you've experienced it in your organization. I think that will help tee up a better conversation around how to kind of influence change. Um, so unless none of you have any dysfunctional behaviors in your organizations around decision making. Um, so again, just show of hands if you've experienced it. Uh, we tolerate dysfunctional behaviors by powerful individuals. Uh, we only account for and reward outcomes. We do not systemically look back at decisions. Uh, we don't frame decisions. We declare a problem and plunge in. I mean, we've, oh, we didn't vote for all of these. Okay. Um, 
Uh, we seldom have a real side-by-side -side comparison of well-thought-out alternatives, even on big decisions. Less of that, that's good. Uh, meetings, 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 and not well prepared, such a waste of time. <laughs> it's just the world. Um, we attempt to be collaborative, but we bog down and can't agree. Oh, that, that looks pretty good. Uh, we use an advocacy process. We don't really consider significantly different alternatives. And the last one, it, we lack clarity about who has the authority and responsibility for making the decision. Everyone who's at Intel should have their hand up on that one. Um, so now to my panelists, um, can you choose can, one? Can I, can Please I go ahead. piggyback on yeah. this? So I, I think that these fit all very well for high tech. And uh, getting to clarity is difficult because the nature of high tech is you need deep expertise technical expertise, okay? So it, that leads to functional organizations to be able to have that deep. So many of the decisions are cross-organizational and need that collaboration. And so then the collaboration creates all the complexity. Mm -hmm. okay? And how to bring that together and make it come to a conclusion in a high quality decision, uh, often it, it's just a, a, a food fight. Okay? It's a, it, can be, it can be organized, but it's not systematic. It's that dialogue and that collaboration. And I think that's at the center. You, and, and I've seen people don't, don't want to deal with the conflict, so they keep the conflict out of the room, mm -hmm. and they face it during execution, wherein it's much more expensive to have that conflict and stuff like this going on. So it, some of that is due to the nature of the business. And I think they really show up again and again. Uh, so um, on that note, how, what, what, what recommendations would you have to like bring awareness to these issues and really try and, I mean, we're talking about culture change, which is, we all know is very hard to do. What tips do you have? Number one, find somebody when they're new in their job and want to change it, okay? If, if, if someone is, uh, uh, we had this webinar recently uh, where uh, a, a client person came in and he says, well, you know, we're just in the transition from an autocratic decision making to a servant leadership model, okay? That's a huge change. There's such an opening for then a, a decision culture change as part of that. Uh, or someone just says, look, we're, it's very frustrated as a decision maker, but you need really the core leadership. You, and you've got to have a big enough unit. It can be a department, it can be a function, it doesn't have to be the whole organization, but somewhere where the leader wants to change the culture because they're <laughs> totally frustrated with, uh, you know, so recently I was with one uh, person that had that power, and uh, he says, I, I just, I'm horrified by the level of rigor that we put in to, to decisions that shape our future, okay? And so that was the opening to, to kind of say, what, what do we do? Another way to start is start with this list of dysfunctional behaviors. You know, think about Lyft, yeah. going mm -hmm. through that poll, mm -hmm. getting 50 people in it, and, and going to your executives and saying, here's what people are saying is really messing up our decision making. Show them they the might data. be open to interest, you yeah. know? a great tip. Um, Shashi, can you talk a little bit about, so one of, you can talk about uh, any dysfunction you want, but there's a lot of interest in this group on the advocacy front. Um, mm -hmm. And if that is, if, if there's, if, if it's an ingrained advocacy culture, like how do you, how do you kind of try to address that? Can you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, th there's a couple of ways that I would answer this. Uh, the first one goes back to KPIs. So measure what matters. If you're frustrated with the amount of meeting time it takes, if you're frustrated with the time it takes to make a decision, we're all in high tech here. We know how to remove friction from experiences. So I go to these people who are frustrated with the decision makers and who have frustrated, uh, who have frustrated decision makers, and I tell them, remove, remove friction from the process of making a decision. Measure how many meetings it takes to get to a decision. If you can remove that by one, by two, by three, pretty soon they're gonna come to you for the process. 
And uh, um, I've, I've seen this time and time again where uh, you know, people who are using my canvas, for example, or who, who are using decision quality remove friction from that process. And pretty soon they're looked at as a, hey, a really great decision maker. And hey, you should really be uh, teaching my organization how to do this. Um, how to break advocacy is a really interesting question. We have uh, advocacy at Intel and uh, very heavily weighted in pro uh, process, products and technology focused. Uh, the perspective that I'll bring to you, that I'll, I'll, I'll say that worked for me, is to think about innovation and the types of innovation. So Larry Keeley has some really interesting body of work around the 10 types of innovation. And uh, he says there's, there's stuff for the business people, stuff for the engineers, stuff for the designers. Uh, the business people tend towards process and organizational change. The engineers are always focused on product, which is all Intel, again. And then uh, designers about a user experience. So if you, can, uh, if, you can say, if you can frame your problem in a way that it can be solved by different types of innovation as opposed to just those, those things that um, the advocate is uh, coming at you or, uh, uh, or uh, the advocate is pushing, then you can, um, you can use this framework. You can use a canvas. You can use uh, you know, decision leadership to, um, to find alternatives, real committable alternatives that are not are not what they're saying. Uh, and that may look um, just as appealing. So. Um, is there any other particular one of those uh, dysfunctions that you're passionate about talking about addressing? Well, I th I, you don't have to. Uh, but let me piggyback a little bit on the advocacy question. Advocacy decision making is probably the most common decision making in almost all organizations. And it often leads to this approval or not approval, okay? Mm -hmm. And so somebody is fighting through the system and trying to convince someone of what they should do because I believe it, okay? Mm -hmm. And in that process, it becomes a people competition. Mm -hmm. the, the person that is the approver pokes real hard and tries to find out whether their confidence should go way up or down on, and then that leads to an approval or no approval. The uh, the antidote to that is to have alternatives compete with each other as opposed to people. So if the approver has already bought in before you've come back with a recommendation and saying, we should look at these four alternatives, okay, uh, and then come in in a second meeting, it's actually much faster because at that point, if you don't show them why one is better than the other, and if you haven't included that approver's best ideas. You know, they're not gonna listen to you. So, so you're gonna end up comparing alternatives that they've already bought in mm -hmm. to kind of, that's the range of stuff we should look at. That's to, to us the, the, the key to breaking that advocacy approval process. And that, that has been very effective uh, to the point where I've had clients that said, Carl, you ta taught me how uh, to ask for alternatives, and why are you giving me this project proposal without showing me what else I could do <laughs> when I'm trying to sell them something? It's <laughs> Watch out. These yeah, things yeah, can be yeah. used <laughs> against you. Um, and, and, and so given, given you know, breaking the advocacy model, um, just kind of thinking about this idea that there are you know, people that have decision rights and people that have information that inform those decisions, how, how does the use of decision quality uh, change the power balance? It, it, it's huge. Uh, and, and it's a way that the decision makers can be custom, become customers of others in this decision making and lead to good decisions as opposed to having to make the call with swagger. Okay? Mm -hmm. it, it just totally changes the game. And that really appeals to some leaders. Some other leaders like that feel. Okay? They like the feel that I got the power and I can make arbitrary calls and, and don't have to reach a decision quality. I'm just the guy that has the power. You know, from a bottoms up perspective, <clears throat> I think it can help um, the people who don't have power claim some of the decision rights. Um, 
certainly uh, uh, reflect and amplify that they have the decision knowledge. Um, again, with the, the idea that anecdotes aren't, um, aren't, aren't really data, uh, I was helping one of my colleagues uh, put together a presentation on how to, uh, you know, how to exert power when you don't have any. And she wanted to use uh, the canvas as a, as a tool. We were asked by our colleagues to combine our presentations together. And so she didn't understand how to use it uh, in, her own, uh, in her own job. So we, we applied it to one of her problems. And what it allowed her to do was take the, so we are in a services unit. We get paid to, paid to build things for other business units. And the business unit was taking the strategy in a bad direction. So she used um, the frame to claw back some of the decision rights uh, around how the, how the work that she was being uh, that she was being asked to do was, was stupid, number one, and it should be something else. Um, and then uh, she went back over the course of a week. We, were, we iterated over a week just so I could teach her how, how it worked. And uh, she came up with a strategy that uh, showed how unfocused they were. And then she uh, used that in a meeting in front of the manager and the decision makers to show them uh, that they should be doing you know, something else got full agreement, they delegated the rights to her mm -hmm. to make the, 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 those decisions, the next few decisions. And then within a week of her applying this, she got funding for her project, something she'd been having, going back to those meetings, six months worth of meetings back and forth, solved in a week. So uh, we have about a minute left. Um, thank you for all your insights so far. What do you want to leave the group with in terms of you know, the best way to drive change in their organizations? Decision quality is not na natural to people. We don't do it in our heads. So you have to wake them up first and get them to see. And then there's a huge gain for relatively little effort. Uh, and that's what we need to mind. You, you got to lead with value and, fill it in, and, and how much benefit you can get for it uh, and, and get the decision makers demanding it. And I, I can't agree with this more. And I say the, may, the way, maybe the way you get to that point is to speak the language of decision quality, remove friction from the processes. And every time a decider sees a decision, they see, they see the tools of de decision quality. Every time they see that tool, uh, every time they, um, is, is one more time that they're going to uh, start expecting it and they're going to ask for it and they're going to make it part of uh, the new employee orientation training, for, uh, for example. Uh, I mean, that's, for me, that would be an amazing measure for, for, for something, uh, for someone who's wanting to make change, uh, is if it's, if it's being asked for, the, the velocity of that, and, uh, and then it doesn't become part of the, the corporate training, so. I'll leave you with a couple of my thoughts. Um, so from driving lots of change throughout organizations over my career, uh, I think you do need a sponsor. It's good to find an exec sponsor. Uh, but I also think most change is driven from the ground. And so I think that uh, uh, success uh, buys you more uh, leeway to continue with that success. So I think it's like find a sponsor, start small, influence uh, heavily. And I think you know that's a really great way to start. I want to thank both of you for your time today and all of you for presenting kind of questions that were uh, captivating for us. Thank you. Thank you.